Go to cinema, man. What are you, uh, what are you up to today? Um, today, I'm over at our new uh, bakery slash supper club, club forum, Fauna. Uh, got here in the morning, checked in on breakfast. Uh, had a meeting with uh, Chef Brandon, who's the uh, owner, founder of the group that I'm a partner in. We went and, you know, had a, had a quick catch up and now I'm talking to you and then I'll be working service tonight and we're going to knock it out. And then all of our restaurants are closed for the 4th of July. So that's, that's super nice. And everybody's looking forward to a little reprieve. So nice, man. Well, I, I do have a bunch of questions about uh, farm hospitality group because I, we couldn't find a ton of information on it, but I'm going to ask you a, a bunch <laughs> about that. Um, but, you know, just because we've, uh, We've met in person a few times and, and chatted a bunch. I, I just wanted this opportunity selfishly to just learn more about your background. I know like your cooking background because uh, you can just Google that and find where you work. <laughs> you worked for Spike for a long time, like that. But like, where are you from? Like, how did you how did you get into all this? I I, I don't know any of that. Yeah, I, I grew up in Nashville. Um, started working in restaurants when I was a kid and and fell in love with it. And you know, I realized that the uh, chances of me playing professional sports were uh, few and far between. So it was like, I took that same kind of tenacity that I had for sports and translated in the kitchen. And you you know, I just started trying to work at the best places that I could. And, you know, the rest is kind of history, you know, just head down and, you know, honing, honing the craft is kind what, of what, what I was always chasing and, and just trying to do. What sports, I was. Did you, what sports did you play? I was a big baseball player. Gotcha. So S still play? No, At never. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even really watch it. <laughs> Except for the Savannah Bananas, you know? What's that? So the Savannah Bananas is the local uh baseball team. And it's it's more of a, a show than it is baseball now. Uh they have their own like they call it banana ball, but there's like lots of singing and dancing and it's like a real Showmanship situation. It's pretty amazing to watch. It sounds um, kind of like the Harlem Globetrotters of Savannah exactly baseball. It's it's the Harlem Globetrotters of baseball. Exactly. Very cool. You know, like people will do like trick plays. Like they'll hit a ball to the outfield, and the guy will do a backflip before he catches it. That's awesome. Pretty fun. <laughs> yeah. So so you were I met you in D.C. You were at the a uh, Rakes Progress at the Line Hotel, right? Um, so obviously Nashville, D.C. I think you obviously bounced around some more as well, but. But um, I'm curious about the Savannah like scene. Like, what is what is the the culinary community like in Savannah? It's really good. It's a really tight knit community. Um, you know, I think that the restaurant scene is really growing. I think that there's a lot of really good chefs that came from major markets. You know, um, Andrew Brochu opened up Brochu's family tradition. You know, he came from the Alinea Group. Uh, you know, Kyle Giacovino has Victoria Pizza, which is right next door to. Florent Fauna, and he worked, you know, for Hugh Atchison for a long time. You know, Chris Hathcock, he goes by Chino, um, you know, worked with uh, Ryan Smith at Empire State South. And, you know, he worked for Sean and he was the chef at Hus for a long time. So there's also more chefs that I'm probably leaving out. You know, Brandon, who's the chef and founder of our group, was with the Ritz-Carlton for a really long time, you know, in Naples and, you know, a lot of the like really old school you know, hardcore kind of French style Ritz Carlton yeah. dining room areas. So there's a lot of energy in Savannah. You know, it's like Charleston was a few years ago. I'm imagining I wasn't there, but that's what I've been told. And, you know, it's just really fun. And, you know, it's not as uh, cutthroat as a DC is, I would say, like chefs are super open. Everyone is, you know, super friendly and, you know, willing to share you know, best practices or, you know, what's going on or business levels or, you know, everything like that. So. Yeah. Are there spots that everybody goes to after work? Yeah, there are. Yeah. There's a bar called Over Yonder and it's kind of a uh, Western theme bar and they have, I think they have the best burger in town. Uh, so definitely nice. the, the, the place to go. Nice. So, um, you, you also spent a much time just in Georgia working uh, actually, like, I think it was like a decade, right? For 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 Roy was that was that right before you yeah I worked for Roy kind of all over the place you know I worked for him in Atlanta I worked for him uh, in Florida in Jacksonville Beach Florida and then I traveled around with him a lot like 
do an LA food and wine festival. You know, if there's a dinner on the East coast that he was cooking at, you know, somewhere in Florida, you know, I would generally be there. So, yeah, so and then, uh, Yamaguchi for, for, <laughs> we didn't really preface that, but. <laughs> Uh, and then uh, I finished with Roy's in uh, Baltimore, and that's how yeah. I ended up in Baltimore. What was it like working with for for Roy's for for a decade? It was great, you know. Like I think uh, at the time, like the balance of you know corporate systems and cooking techniques that were you know mandatory and like really kind of like uh, I guess beaten into you was like it was the perfect balance for me, you know, because like there was all this structure around like how you can improve. There was like, there were a lot of rules as to like what you could and could not do because at the time Royce was owned by Outback Steakhouse. So it had kind of all the corporate structure with kind of Roy's vision for the food. So for me, like I learned, you know, how to process a PL, how to read a PL, how to really dive deep into PL, you know, like I had to send an email every morning when I was a chef partner that was like, hey, we're going to spend, you know, 1400 bucks on labor today. We're going to do this many covers. This is what the sales are going to be. And, you know, that's the plan for the day. And like, if it was off by $100 or more, my phone would ring the next morning by 9 a.m. And like, <laughs> like, if you did better, if you spent $100 less, it'd be like, hey, why'd you spend $100 less? Yeah. And you'd be like, oh, yeah. you know, like the first time I was like, oh, I don't really know. And like, you know, this is an, you know, the early 2000s. So it's like the, it was 11 bucks an hour. So it's like, well, what did someone do for nine hours? Yeah. And I'm like, well, I don't know. Well, what do you mean you don't know? You don't know what one, one person did for nine hours. And I'd be like, oh, all right. So then like that really got me. Who was that? Who, this, who was that person that was asking you that? Uh, his name's Mark Anders. But I mean, like the role, like what was that? Was that like the controller? Uh, or was it? No, it was uh, his title was joint venture partner. So like kind of like a regional manager, if you will. Yeah. I didn't realize Royce was owned by Outback. And is it still owned by Outback? No, you, not at all. So they they, they um, divested or how did that work? I'm not sure how it all, all went down, but I believe that Blumen Brands which was Outback, became Blumen Brands, sold it to like a private equity group. Ah, gotcha. And I okay, think cool. Roy was not involved anymore. And then there's only a couple of them left yeah. on, on the mainland. But so, he's still, he's still doing in Hawaii in a pretty big way, so. Yeah, yeah. So that's crazy, by the way. So, so you would, you would essentially forecast the sales for the next day. And then based on that, you would also say, here's how much I'm going to spend on a daily basis. You did that? Daily basis. That's crazy. Well, you had to forecast it for the month. You know, there was like this crazy spreadsheet. And like, so you did like your, your food sales forecast, your labor, you know, your labor, your daily labor forecast, you know, as a projection. And then like the day of, you can go in and change it and be like, Hey, this is what I'm actually going to spend today because you know, Hey, yeah. we picked up a, a party. Hey, business is down. Hey, we're trending down 2%. So I got to spend less on labor, you know? And yeah. then you would plug in what, what it, what it is, email it. And then like at the end of the night, the closing manager would put what the actual was, send it off and yeah, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember doing the same often, but typically it was like a flash report that was just like generated on like, you know, like a trailing 12 week, you would just get the forecast for the next week based on the trailing 12 and, and I never, never, I've never heard of it done manually. That's pretty, that's pretty cool. But how accurate were you? It was pretty accurate. I, I would say that it was within like a couple points. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. And, and what did month. you use? Like, how did you forecast a month? Was it, did you also just use like a trailing 12 week or like, how did you come right, up Right, trailing that? 12 week. Like, yeah. you know, and then like historical data, you know, this month versus last year versus two years ago. Yeah. Plus yeah. the tra trailing 12 week. And then you're just, you know, you're obviously making the best educated guess you can. Yeah. It's so interesting because there's, there's a lot of, AI technology or machine learning technology, you know, it's like forecasting revenue. Right and now. Yeah. Now. Yeah. yeah now, but, but you just said you're, you know, a couple of points at 98% accuracy is right. Um, that's, that's better than any AI model. <laughs> right. Um, uh -huh. do you do that yeah, today with your restaurants? No, we don't do that. that, that no. I mean, we, we have a lot of tools and like, we definitely manage proactively, but like, 
we're we're more interested in like the chefs cooking cooking delicious food for our guests than like them being you know kind of like in, in, inundated with like a spreadsheet and you know yeah, like yeah they obviously have a constant schedule and i review their constant schedule every thursday and you know we talk about it we talk about the plan for the week and then we execute the plan you know so we don't yeah you know get to the end of the month and be like oh labor's 60 percent. what are we gonna do yeah yeah <laughs> well um and by the way i forgot to say this but i wanted because i wanted to say it earlier when we start chatting is that like we're kind of I'm kind of anchoring this call on you being a dad in like two months. Yeah, two months, um, literally two months. So I, we, I, I looked at the schedule and I think this is supposed to go out in like, I don't know, like in, end of August or early September. But I want to time it so that it goes out like right close to when you're supposed to be a dad. So we yeah, can, September 19th. So you can have a little archive of like, um, <laughs> of like here's before I was a dad. Yeah, here's before. Oh, <laughs> September 19th? Okay, I'm ready. Yeah. Right um, tell me tell me about um about the restaurant group that you're working for. Uh, so Farmhouse Hospitality Group, um, you know, Brandon Carter and uh, Ryan Williamson, who's our founders, you know, they started the group with Farm, you know, about eight years ago. Uh, you know, Brandon was a chef at Palmetto Bluff, which is a oh, yeah. really high-end, yeah. uh, you know, resort hotel operation on here and uh ryan was selling in produce uh you know at, at the at the restaurant and at the resort and ryan was like hey i'm gonna i really want to open this restaurant in bluffton and brandon was just kind of like yeah i'm not really interested ryan was like why don't you design the kitchen for me and then like you know once you design the kitchen you're like ah this could be really amazing and uh you know the rest is history you know farm opened you know very successful restaurant in bluffton south carolina um, focused on, you know, cooking with the landscape of the low country, using local purveyors, uh, you know, they have a wood fired oven. So that was all, you know, kind of what attracted me there. And then, you know, about three years ago, they opened common thread, um, in Savannah, Ryan's originally from Savannah. Um, so they always had a desire to, to come to this market, uh, two years ago. We opened Wildflower Cafe in the Telfair Museum. Uh, that was Annie's uh, int introduction to the company. Annie's my wife for the people that are on the podcast that don't know. Um, <laughs> so we opened Wildflower Cafe. You know, it's there's no hood there. It's just like, you know, a couple of panini presses, a really small, you know, ventless convection oven. And, you know, we do really delicious sandwiches and salads and grain bowls and kind of healthier fare for the museum goers. Um, and then we opened Strange Bird, which started as a food truck during COVID. Um, we opened it as a brick and mortar, and it's kind of like a Latin-inspired barbecue, tacos, burritos. But then we kind of take the strange and and tap other cuisines. You know, there's some Asian influence, there's some Middle Eastern influence, and you know, it's a lot of fun using you know local products to kind of showcase what can be done with them. Yeah. Um, and then we just opened Flora and Fauna about 60 days ago um, in the old back in the day bakery space where Cheryl Day and Griff Day uh, operated for 22 years. Uh, their last service was on Valentine's Day and we opened uh, 60 days later. So, wow, that's crazy. we really, uh, really flipped it. And, and Annie's there as well, right? Annie's the executive chef of Flora and Fauna. So in the morning, it's bakery, breakfast, lunch. And then at night, we changed to a supper club. So the the dining room kind of doesn't change, but it does shift in the vibe switches. And we do a, a prefix menu, three course prefix menu for $55. Yeah. So what's it? I'm curious now, like your role as the, as a you know, culinary director, you know, you have all these executive chefs and, and the chef probably doing these restaurants. Like what's your day to day like? Um, you know, we're mid opening right now. So, uh, Brandon and I are both living at Flora and Fauna you know, making sure that we get systems in place, making sure that we get, you know, costs in line pretty quickly, making sure that, you know, our chefs are executing the vision. And then, you know, I kind of uh, play the field a little bit. Like I like to check in on everybody. So I'll stop by each restaurant, 
see how everyone's doing. And then if someone is needing more help, you know, maybe they have, you know, a sous chef that needs a little bit more mentoring, or maybe they have, you know, they're wanting to do a dish for a wine dinner and they need some help with the technique. Like I kind of make myself available to go and, and put out the fires. And like, if someone calls out for their shift, like I'll generally slide over and cover, or if someone goes on vacation, I cover the restaurant. You know, we just changed chefs at farm. Um, a few months ago, we hired a really good chef, uh, from Atlanta, but during the transition for the four months that we were without a chef, I was essentially the chef there. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, plug and play. How do you, so what's the, like, how do you like interface with, with, with all the chefs? I mean, are you, uh, obviously it sounds like you're developing, you know, new menu items with them and you're also stepping in on the line when, when needed. Um, but do you all work on like growth? Absolutely. You know, I think, you know, I check in every morning with, with most of the chefs, like we have a, a text thread and, you know, we get a, a nightly recap. Hey, this was great. Hey, this was not great. This was the team. So-and-so did well. So-and-so did not do well. Hey, we really have to focus on, you know, line checks this week because, you know, Scarlett ran out of beats on her station last night at, at 8.45 on the last turn. Like, you know, I got that last night this morning. I touched base with the chefs. I'm like, hey, let's make sure that we get some real good energy around line checks this week. Let's make sure that we're grabbing Kelly, who's, you know, one of our junior sous chefs and like making sure that he's getting in there and like, getting his hands in it as well and making sure that we're pushing him to do the things that we need him to do to step up to be a leader. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, independent of, of sort of like the day-to-day -day, um, improvements in the operation, are there things that like you do or uh, you do with your team to just grow and learn outside of the things that you're doing? I always find like, you know, like we get, we get older, we start like, you know, now we're like running businesses and managing lots of people and a lot of time is spent on that. Um, I'm always like super curious how, how everybody um, continues to learn, uh, you, you know, the things that you were learning before, like, are you, are, are you, does everybody buy books together? Are you going out? Like what? Right. Like, you know, one of the things that I'm a big, I have like a few, like a handful of books that I really like. One of them is called uh, Work Clean. Um, I actually think they changed the name of it. I don't think it's called that anymore, but it's by this author. His name's Dan Charnas. And it's not really a book for chefs. It's it's more of a book about chefs and about mise en place. And it's kind of like teaches people that work in an office how chefs work. You know what I mean? Because like we work in this very specific way where like most things are black and white. You know what I mean? Like you're going to come in, you have to have your prep done by this specific time because we're going to open. And like whether or not like you meet that deadline or not is not like optional. Like, it, you know, in an office work, it's like, oh, hey, you know, I'm a little bit behind today. I didn't get the deadline by five o'clock. Like someone's like, oh, okay. Like, you know, we'll just get it going tomorrow. But for us in the kitchen, there is no tomorrow. So I, I really like that. Um, I'm a big fan of Audible um, because I spend a lot of time in the car driving to Bluffton. That's how I love listening to your podcast, obviously. So your podcast is on my ro rotation. and then. Books on Audible, nice is is in the heavy rotation. It is it is interesting how um I actually I was just talking about this with my team yesterday or my, my I don't remember if my CS my, my sales team of of just you know ownership. It's there, there's so many lessons I feel like in the in the in the kitchen that translate really well to any any industry. I, Mise en right. place is obviously like king, right? Like being prepared, right? Um, but you know I, I was telling them yesterday about um you know, owning your station, right? So like if you're the saucier at, you know, whatever, Restaurant X, right? Right. Like everything about that station, you own. It's your temp, right? How clean right. is it? How organized is it? Where does it, is it stocked? Where does this stuff live? Like, how are you placing things so that it's, you know, it's efficient? Um, like that's yours and you train someone else in that station. It's like you're a little micro business. And I think that's a pretty cool part about like uh, being a cook, right, is you get this little micro business in a way, right? Like you got to make sure that like all the stuff that you need to get to order gets ordered for the, I mean, if it's that type of kitchen, right? And all, everything that has to do with your station, if you're the poissonier or the saucier, if you're 
or whatever the name is, depending on, you know, it's American, obviously different names, but, um, you, you kind of become like the, the, you know, the manager or the CEO of your little business. And that's really right. translated. To, uh, and I think that what's interesting is it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't come across that way in other industries sometimes, uh, at least it's like the, the perspective doesn't come that way. Um, where like, if you have a job as a whatever, right? Like you have a boss and they tell you what to do and, and, um, you have your instructions and you follow them and, and that's kind of, you know, and you have your metric of success and then that's it. And everything outside of that purview is like, that's not really my job. Not to say that you're not working hard, but or that you want, don't want to do more, but like you have this sort of box. And I feel like what's, what's cool about kitchens is, is, um, when you have a station, that box is kind of everything. I don't know if you agree, right. but. No, 100%. Like, you know, the, the dish room is your station, you know? Yeah. If, if if the courts aren't dry, that's your station. Yeah. If the if the if the pots and pans aren't organized, that's your station. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It's also your product, right? It's right. Really, what's which is so interesting about it. Like if you have like spotless glasses, or you have like, you know, all the sauces are like spot on and seasoned perfectly, right. and they're like refreshed and like that's your that's your that's your product of the of a of a of a, of a large business, and um, you don't get that in 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 um in in a lot of other like industries but in ours it's like you you like every single person has like their little business right um so you know you talked about like books and things like that but do you guys are there other things like outside of books that you all do to, to continue to learn uh you know we definitely go out and eat we definitely talk about food we definitely you know we have little jam sesh sessions for the menu you know once or twice a month you know especially like Right now, as things are like, you know, moving pretty rapidly, like we'll meet with all the chefs and sous chefs and like everyone will come with ideas and we'll kind of round table like, oh, I'm thinking about, you know, this chicken dish with, you know, a golden zucchini puree that we fold into rice and make kind of like a risotto or, you know, whatever it is. And then we kind of like flesh that out, especially for like younger cooks, like trying to take, you know, the vision. I always use like the A, B, and C. You know what I mean? It's like lots of people can can do the A where they're like, I can think of this incredible thing. And then, you know, the B is the hardest part because you have to, you know, source, execute, cost, write a recipe that somebody else can also do. And then C, you have to put it on the plate and make it beautiful for the guest every single time. So I feel like A and C a lot of times people have but the b is like where you know like i'm not trying to plug me's but i am trying to plug me's is like for us like that's where where me's is like the most helpful because like you know we we share it throughout all of our concepts so we're like uh chef joseph has this amazing recipe for this japanese barbecue sauce i think that would go really awesome with this short rib jump on me's look at it you know if you make some tweaks like let us know and and we'll look at it together and then we'll yeah. We'll make version two or whatever. I totally agree, man. I got, you know, it's funny. I have this like, I don't even know where I heard this saying, but um, there's a saying that it's way more important what you can do consistently every day than any one thing that you can do amazing, you know, just one day, right. you know, kind of, it applies to everything, like even exercising, right? Like you could crush one workout and just like balls to the wall. But what's more important is can you do a, a, a similar workout every single day for, you know, or whatever, like consistently over the course of time. And I think that's, it's so true with food. You know, I think it, and it's also something you learn over time, obviously, as a cook. I don't know how, how you think about this, but it, it doesn't really matter how sick of a dish you can create on your own once that looks beautiful. It's like, I mean, it's like the typical mistake you see when you see someone creating like a a dish that has 72 steps to it and it looks really cool, but like nobody can execute right. it. You know, like how do you make food that can actually be executed the same way every single day by someone else other than you? Um, and that, that's what's really special and, uh, and a skill that, that you have to learn as a chef. Yeah, I think it, it, oh, it always drives me crazy though. when you like, you see something on like the internet, right? Social media, whatever it is. And then you go to that place and you order that thing. 
and it looks nothing like it. And you're like, what happened? Like, why would I, like, I came here for this thing. I thought it was going to be amazing. And like, it's not even close, you know, sometimes, you know? So. Yeah. Well, what's worse is if you go someplace and, and this is what, this is, this is my number one reason for not going back to someplace because I get so scared is if I have something, let's just say I have something that's awesome. And then I come back and I want to order it again. And it's like totally different. Doesn't, it's not the same thing at all. And doesn't taste good. I don't want to go back ever again. Cause I'm like, I'm scared what the next time will be. Cause if I have something else that's good and I want to come back and order it, am I going to be disappointed? Right. Exactly. And that's, that's like the most important part of any restaurant, maybe any business is just, can you, can you be consistent in what you're executing? It's way better to be consistently good than once in a while be incredibly amazing, you know? At least I, I think so. I don't know. Obviously there's, right. sure there's different takes on that, but that's, you know, for me, like I totally agree. A restaurant. How do you like help your team with that? Like, how do you help them? You have all these sous chefs and chefs and across all these different places. Like, what do you, what do you all to do to sort of help maintain consistency and like make sure that when you're developing a new dish, you're thinking through, okay, how are we going to execute this? You know, at scale. You know, I think for for us, we have really good leaders in place that have, that have worked with us and they kind of understand, you know, the score, if you will, you know, like they understand, like, there's not necessarily like a formula, but there's, you know, all these notes that we have to hit in order to make sure that we're, we're, we're going to put this dish on the menu. And like our menus change so frequently that like, you know, sometimes a, a dish may change mid service, you know, pre presentation wise, because, you know, when we played it during ser before service, we realized that like, oh, this is not attainable during service to make sure that it goes out in time and manner. Let's do this like this. Let's do this like this. And like, let's make this quick kind of change in the moment so that it is executable. It is beautiful. And it is most of all delicious, you know? So giving people the, the confidence to say like, hey, you know what? Like, I realize now that this isn't going to work to their team and like, change it kind of mid mid service is something that we definitely like try to instill in the team and like making sure that it works is the most important part is that the get what the guest receives is delicious beautiful and it makes them want to come back yeah how often are you changing your menu so like on the job um every day at most places like we don't change the whole menu but like something will change because you know you know if a farmer doesn't have you know squash for example right like farmer larry comes today and he's like hey i don't have the squash you know like we don't like call up you know baldor and say like hey like let's get 10 cases of squash in here like we're like okay cool like what do we have let's pivot from squash and let's do you know x or let's do y and so that kind of forces us to change the menu as well as be creative with you know, the landscape of the ingredients that we have. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely keeps you, keeps you on your toes. I remember, uh, we had this, um, this like tempura squash, winter squash dish. It was a kabocha squash, um, or red curry squash. Um, it's like a red curry squash tempura that we roasted and then tempura. And then there was like this really cool grafting maple, like cheddar, you know, grafting mission dip for it. Um, some chili pepper in there. And, um, like red curry squash was still like random to get. Like you, you got it sometimes, but not always. It had a very right. particular flavor. And so like sometimes it would be, we would get kabocha in. Sometimes we couldn't get any because the squash was still not like, you know, it was taking a long time to get ripe. And we'd use sweet potatoes. But like every time, um, you know, you have to do slight tweaks to the batter or to like how you, you know, how you roast it or how you fried it. And it was a like, pain. And uh, it's really hard when you're, you know, when you're just buying from, farms and you're using those kinds of products does that is that like a daily or like a, a, a pretty consistent um like dynamism of your menu where you're where you you're, you're constantly sort of like tweaking a product because you're buying so many farms right exactly like, like how often does that happen we're always tweaking we're always what where someone shows up without something or yeah where you have to tweaking. like swap you know you 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 use turnips and whatever they they have, you know, um, 
they don't they don't have time groups today like a motivator or something you know not 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 a ton right now in this in this current season because like right now we're in the like bountiful summer you know everyone has a ton of tomatoes everyone has a ton of summer squash you know like so you know we're we're not in, in that scenario but like Last week, like we put a gazpacho on at Florin Pana and we we were using sun gold tomatoes because we really like the way that the like skin adds like a little tan into the gazpacho. And then, you know, no one has sun gold tomatoes. So like, you know, we have to adjust the recipe. You know, we're using a different cherry tomato. Like, hey, this needs like a little smoked paprika now. Hey, this needs like a little bit more cucumber. Hey, this needs a little bit more olive oil to like get that richness that this sun gold tomato was giving to us. So like those kind of things you know, working with the ingredient and understanding that like, hey, the, the ingredient may be a little bit different today and like we need to taste it and make sure that it's going to give us the same result. And then we don't get the same result. It's not like, oh, okay, like this is good. I made the recipe. We're good. You know, like someone brings it to the chef to try and the chef's like, hey, like this needs a little bit more acid. This means a little bit more, you know, salt. This needs a little bit more, whatever it is, you know, and then we adjust from there. Which, you know, will sometimes frustrate our cooks because we're like, hey, we have this great app. You know, we have these, you know, uh, Kindle fires that are that are in the kitchen and like cooks walk up and he's like, hey, I need to make, you know, pimento cheese today. I have, you know, hey, they shorted us on cheese. I have this much cheese. Does the recipe and then we taste and we're like, hey, it needs a little bit more X. And he's like, oh, I followed the recipe. I'm more like, yeah, like, you did a great job following the recipe, but like, we're going to make sure that it's like exact every time. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to kind of migrate over to something a little bit more personal. Like I said, uh, so you have, you, you have, you have a baby coming in like two months now, I think almost exact like two and a half months. Yes. Uh, first kid, right? Yeah. 60 days ish. First kid. What are you nervous about? How you planning? You know, like, obviously I'm a big planner. Uh, as you know, we, we've met in person and talked about planning and executing. And I think we coordinated a breakfast together and at, at the, at DC. And I was like, you know, like, Hey, like we're going to do it this time, this time, this time, this time, this time. And you're like, I'm not sure what time people are going to show up. And I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> we'll just wait till people show up and then we'll do it. You know what I mean? And I'm like, you know, so obviously like I'm a planner, you know, uh, you know, there's someone installing some, uh, some built-in cabinets in my living room right now that, uh, so we can get a little bit more storage, you know, an older house in Savannah doesn't have, uh, modern storage, if you will. Um, so, you know, just, you know, there's a, there's a prep list, you know, we're, we're prepping meals to go into the freezer for when the baby comes so that, you know, things are are seamless and we don't have to think about that, you know, like just trying to eliminate the variables, just kind of like doing anything that we do is, you know, there's variables that you can control and there's variables that you can't control and controlling the controllables and letting the rest happen. So. Yeah. Well, there's one thing about kids is, uh, there's a lot you can't control, <laughs> but it's, right, that's exactly. actually one of the great, that's one of the great, like, uh, reasons for, uh, well, Visa Plus, when you're thinking about like preparing for a kid is that, you know, the, the great thing about Visa Plus is, especially if you're somewhere where you're changing the menu every day or something like that, like if you, as long as you plan for everything that you can plan for, you're prepared for all the madness that inevitably is going to ensue. And that is most certainly the case, you know, when you're having a kid. I remember <laughs> we, we planned, we got all these meals together. We got the, 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 the room set up ahead of time you know, got all the little infant clothes and things like that. And like, you know, the, the, the food for us was fine. Everything else just out, out the door, you know, it's funny. The way I tell everybody is like, don't buy a lot of infant clothes because they basically wear the same shirt. <laughs> we had like 60 pairs of like all these infant things. And like, you know, they're, you know, after, after a month, it's, it's a different size anyways, but like, um, you know, you get all this stuff prepared, prepared and then it's just. You, you know, everything is a curveball, uh, but it's exciting, man. It's exciting. I, are you both taking off from work? Right. Yeah. We'll both uh, take a few weeks off of work. Nice. How's she yeah. feeling? 
Great. You know, uh, opening a restaurant and being pregnant at the same time has been challenging, but you know, she's, uh, she's bustling through it, doing good. It's nuts. Yeah. It always seems yeah. to come all at the same time. <laughs> it always happens that way. Yeah. Um, are you, did you have like the room set up and everything? We don't have the room set up yet now. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah you, got, you got about six months before. Next month. Well, about eight months until you actually, yeah. actually need a room. Um, cool, man. Well, right. like, are, are you like, how do you think, how do you think that I'm asking you this because you're going to listen to this after you've had a kid. Um, how do you think that your work is going to change after the baby's born? I'll definitely have to be more structured in how I allow my time to be used. Cause now I'm, you know, I'll do, I'll do anything at any time, make it happen, you know, that sort of thing. So I think like trying to, to organize my time so that I can be more effective during the hours that I need to be effective rather than like waiting for someone to need me in a moment that I might not be available. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How, how do you think you're going to change as a person and as a leader? There'll be more empathy, I'm sure. Um, I feel like I'm pretty empathetic already, but, uh, a lot of my friends have been like, yeah, I just like, you know, things that were crazy important, you know, the way that, you know, this certain thing had to be forever, you know, like all of a sudden didn't seem like that big of a deal. And I'm like, I, I don't know what you mean. You know, like they're like, you'll have things that like you're so passionate about that, you know, may or may not affect, you know, the guest experience. And then when you have the kid, you're like, you know, that doesn't really matter anymore. We're good. Yeah. yeah. What, so. so what do you, by the way, what do you do um, when you're not working right now? Like, didn't, like I'm not let's, working let's, right now? let's refrain from anything you're prepping for the kids. But like, generally speaking, what do you do for fun or enjoyment or, 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 you know, pleasure when you're not, when you're not um, cooking and or working in a business? You know, I like to ride my bike, run, exercise. That sort of stuff, but definitely go to the beach. You know, we're 15 minutes from the beach and you know, that's a, that's a big re relaxation point for me. So nice. I promise there's a, there's a reason why I'm asking you this. So that when we, when we, when you look back on it, uh, <laughs> you know, in, in a year from now, we can just <laughs> see how, see how you, what you think. Um, but I'm excited for you, man. Um, and also just really grateful that we, that we could find some time to catch up. Um, I know we text, you know, every once in a while, but I was glad to have you come on and, and just chat for a little bit. And I'm super excited for you to become a dad. Um, and I'm excited to see how things change for you when that happens. Yeah, I'm excited too.